On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, the bottom falls out of the Rhine River. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercogliano. Welcome to this episode. So we've talked a lot this year about the decline and lowering of rivers, inland rivers in particular, and how that is impacting global shipping. Now, understand, this is cyclical. We see this happen all the time. We'll see rivers rise, and that is as much a negative effect as a river dropping. But it's important to put into context what this means. Uh, again, I am not attributing the cause of this to anything. What I'm talking about is the impact a low river, in particularly the Rhine River, is going to have on global shipping. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into into this story. So this is the story of Bloomberg's story on G Captain that talks about it. Europe's parched lifeline flashes trade disruption warning. Shallow water on the Rhine are disrupting uh, barge traffic and forcing up the cost of shipping, an early indicator the continent may need to brace for a redux of the seismic economic shock caused by last year's drought. Just to put that into context, this is a story from August last year, also on G Captain from Bloomberg. Uh, the Rhine River's water levels at a key water water point hit a new low, risking the transit uh, of fuel and other goods as Europe's climate crisis exasperates its energy supply crunch. The marker at Kaub, a particularly shallow point west of Frankfurt, briefly dropped to 30 centimeters, 11.8 inches earlier Monday before edging back up. Now, this is back in August. And what we're seeing is a similar situation happening today. If you look at a drought map, of Europe, you get the indication of why this is important. Uh, because it's been a very mild winter, both in Europe and parts of the United States. I'm in beautiful North Carolina. It, it's we, We're having a cold day today, but it's been abnormally warm here for us. And Europe is having the same thing. This has impacted the LNG and energy market quite a bit. Remember, there was a big fear that Russia was going to turn off natural gas and oil to Europe and Europe was going to freeze, but it's been a fairly mild, warmer winter. Uh, the flip side of that is there hasn't been snow, there hasn't been precipitation, and that means that key areas that feed into rivers, particularly in the Rhine River down here in Switzerland and northern Italy, southern Germany, France, and even up here in Austria are not getting the water levels they need, which means that it's not feeding into the river. Uh, go back to the original story, an atypical mild winter and concurrent lack of precipitation precipitation are having consequences across Europe, particularly for farmers and energy producers. Much of France and even southern UK has had less than a quarter of the normal rainfall. You can see that there in red. Uh, and some growers are trimming plantings of potatoes, carrots, parsnips, and onions because they may not have enough water to irrigate them in the coming months. Reservoir levels for some hydroelectric producers have dipped, potentially crimping output just as countries try to wean off fossil fuels and bolster renewables renewable sources of energy. So a lot of the hydroelectric power may be in danger here, causing brownouts across Europe. Because again, you've taken yourselves off of natural gas from Russia. We're seeing natural gas shipped over to Europe via ships in the form of liquefied natural gas. We're seeing diesel fuel shipped over, but not to the same levels quite yet. In France, where prolonged droughts pushed production from electric dams to the lowest since 1976 last year, a dearth of rainfall in recent weeks is prompting concerns at major energy plants, which produce the bulk of nation's hydropower. It goes on here. Hydropower generation in the Nordic region, home to Europe's biggest re uh, reserves, remains 10% below the past five-year seasonal average. Hydroelectric levels are starting to decline faster than in recent years. Uh, dry weather over northern Europe is expected to continue next week, but conditions are predicted to get wetter moving into March. Uh, while the Rhine still has some cushion before becoming a full-blown crisis, the parched conditions are a harbinger of what could happen again. Last summer, the drying up of Europe's waterways disrupted an $80 billion trade business, affecting oil refining, chemical production, power generation, and corn farming. Go over here. This is marine traffic, and marine traffic tracks all vessels via their automated information system, their AIS transponders. And one of the things you can see here is cutting through Europe this line of ships that cuts through all the way bisects Europe, which is, makes it very unique. Uh, we don't have a waterway in the United States that bisects the continent the way this does. 
this is the Rhine River. It hooks into the main, uh, which is the main canal, which then hooks into the Danube. And literally, you can sail from Rotterdam all the way out into the Black Sea and come up here right in the Gulf of Odessa off of Snake Island. I don't know if you'd want to do that based on our last video where we talked about war in the Black Sea, but you, you, you can do it. And you see how vitally important this waterway is. They talked about low water levels, and that's in this region right here uh, between uh, Koblenz and down here to Wies Wiesbaden. Here's Kalb right down here. And these vessels that navigate uh, the river here, just to pop up one at random to show you here, these are typical kind of inland motor uh, vessels. Very small, shallow draft, house back aft. Uh, people literally live on these things. This is their homes for many people. And they haul cargo between Germany, the Netherlands, uh, Austria, into the interior of Europe. It is a sizable business. And to put this into context, <clears throat> this map kind of gives you the, the, the imagery here of the uh, routes. So you can see in the really dark line there on the Rhine River, you're talking about a sizable amount of traffic moving up and down. You're talking about anywhere in the range of 60 billion ton kilometers moving up and down the Rhine River. The Danube also has a sizable amount moving down here. And then the link here in the main uh, Danube Canal, which isn't as much. There, there's not a huge amount that transits between the main and Danube uh, Canal, but it does exist. And then you have the inland waterway systems that bisect Belgium. Uh, into northern Germany, and even the Seine itself cutting in here. So a big river system that does exist. If you really want to get the detail on this and go a little bit more in depth than I'm going, then head on over to here. This is the Central Commission for the Navigation of the Rhine. They put out annual reports on this, and I have it pulled up here, Chapter 2, their chapter on freight transport on inland waterways. And just a couple of highlights here. Transport volume on the traditional Rhine increased by 5.4% in 2021, and transport performance by 4.5% compared to 2020. For container transport on the Rhine, uh, 1.99 million TEUs were recorded in 2021. In general, container transport on the Rhine has weakened in recent years due to a combination of macroeconomic, natural, and port-related factors. On the upper and middle Danube, transport volumes are on average lower in 2021 than in 2022. An important exception was the Austrian Danube around Vienna. The lower Danube region, in particular the canals connecting the Danube to the Black Sea, recorded a cleared upward trend in goods transport. This obviously has to link back to the issues of the uh, Black Sea War. So a couple of charts here real quick. Here is the transport performance in main European countries. You can see how Germany and Netherlands absolutely dominate this trade. Uh, so that gives you the reason why the Rhine River is so significant here. Go on here, the yearly inland waterway transport with the Germany handling 48% and the Netherlands 47%, and then you have uh, Romania at 13.5%. And then here you can see the amount of transport here in billions of tons, kilometers. So this is not just in tons, but it's it's how much each ton moves by kilometer. So that's what you do. You, you take total tonnage by total kilometers, and this is where you get that figure of roughly around 150 billion uh, tons per uh, ton kilometers here basically it dips down starting in 2017 and you can see it being a little bit lower here go on that's a chart I showed you before on the transport by main European river basins you can see the performance on the traditional Rhine has actually decreased over the years and then here's measurement tons for freight transport breaking the Rhine basin up and different areas so you can see the lower rhine the amount of transport the upper rhine and remember you got to flip the rhine around uh, because the rhine runs from um, south to north so the uh, upper rhine is that closest to switzerland germany and france the lower rhine is down there by the netherlands the wessel D uh, datlin canal the rhine Hern canal the main and you can see again not a lot of traffic going across on the main over to the Danube. A lot of bulk material is what you see being moved. Coal, grain, uh, gravel, mineral, iron ores, chemical, uh, not as much uh, containers as you would expect. And again, you can see that broken down here in a little bit more detail. This is a great report if you wanna get down into the weeds here of the material. 
What's going on on the Rhine River, you can see right here. This is rhineforecast.com. It shows you water levels at various stations along the Rhine. And Cobe, this is the area that I showed you just recently. You can see the very low water level here and the fact that it's decreasing here over time. Forecast precipitation at 20 stations along the Rhine. You can see the historical forecast uh, uh, historical data and then the forecast which has no rain whatsoever here's the monitoring level uh, forecast over time at cove you can see how low rhine forecast has that water going down and even more so here if you look at the uh, the monitoring day plus three forecast over time and so obviously massive water decrease massive low waters on the rhine river now Good storm, changes everything, puts water into the Rhine, feeds it back up, gets it up. But this is going to cause disruptions internally in Rhine, in Europe, excuse me. And what this means is you're going to have to find alternative modes to move cargo if the Rhine River continues. And what's happening here is this is going to be impacting your ability to move goods up and down the Rhine River. When you have Cobe, for example, at such a low level, uh, barges that bring, for example, oil and fuel up will not be able to load at their required levels. Looking forward, a 14-day forecast shows an 86% chance that the measured level at Cobe will be at 97 centimeters, 13 inches, or lower towards the end of the first week of March. That hasn't happened since the beginning of 2014. And with Cobe being as low as it is now, barges are having to basically only load 50% of their capacity to be able to get past the markers and in up and down the river, especially the upper river past Cobe toward Wiesbaden and Frankfurt. And again, which means now cargo will have to shift onto rail and trucks. That means additional cost, additional uh, transportation costs to be able to move cargo within Europe. We've seen this around the world. We've seen this on the Rhine, uh, we've seen it on the Rhine River, but we've also seen it on the Yangtze. We've seen it on the Mississippi. We've seen it on the Piranha down in South America. And so water levels are really important to watch. And again, I really want to emphasize the importance of inland transportation. Uh, because Europe is bisected by the Rhine and the Danube, inland waterways are extremely important for the movement of goods. There is a lot of incentives in Europe to promote inland waterway shipping along with short sea shipping. This is the coastal shipping. And how Europe incentivizes it is something that we in the United States should be looking at too. How can we do this? But again, this is really dependent upon weather. And when weather hits, you have to have not one source to move your goods, but multiple sources to move your goods. And that's a key thing I think we forget about. We want to rely on maybe one mode of transportation to move goods. But in truth, you need multiple modes. Because when one mode is interdicted or there's a problem, there's a, there's a disaster, there's a natural uh, event, you need these other modes to be able to pick them up. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You can hit the super thanks button down below, which allows you to contribute directly to the page, or head on over to Patreon, become a patron of the page. That allows you to support the channel monthly or yearly. I greatly support everybody who helps out via super thanks and Patreon. You all allow me to put these videos together, not have to work multiple other jobs in teaching, which is great because being an adjunct professor is a terrible, terrible job. You paid very little for a lot of work. And I'd much rather do this because number one, I enjoy talking about this topic, as you can tell. And number two, I think it is a great platform to inform people about what is going on with shipping, both on the oceans and the inland waterways commercially and militarily. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off.